but nobody goes to Trent Reznor and is like, hey, can you write this big epic hybrid orchestral cue for right. me? They want Trent Reznor to sound like Trent Reznor. So I was like, maybe that's my way in, is to figure out what unique things I have to say, get as good as I can at making music in my own unique voice, using all of that background that I had to, to kind of differentiate myself maybe from some other people and just go all in on that and just focus on being a recording artist. And then kind of like you said, if I build it, they will come. Mm. And that kind of worked. What is happening everybody? And welcome back to another episode of the 52 Qs podcast, your weekly insight into all things production and library music. Whether you're simply curious about the sync industry, learning to write better cues, or maybe you're ready to pitch to publishers, I promise you, you're in the right place. My name is Dave Croft, and it is so good to be with you today. And if you find this video helpful, then uh, why don't you give it a thumbs up here on YouTube or a five-star review in your podcast app. And please be sure to subscribe because I talk about library music all the time. Today's episode wouldn't be possible without the incredible support of our member subscribers at 52Qs who not only keep our community alive and thriving, but as members, they get access to bonus features like workshops, live streams, office hours, queue breakdowns, Zoom feedback sessions, hundreds of hours of video archives, and opportunities to submit to real music libraries. So, Maybe you're feeling stuck, or maybe you're finally ready to take your sync career to the next level. If this is you, then head over to 52Qs.com. It's free to join, and memberships start at just around four bucks a month. Today, I am so excited to welcome Jameson Nathan Jones to the podcast. He's a very accomplished composer with a fantastic YouTube channel. You should go subscribe. And he's found a bridge between classical piano and modern synthesis. He's also not afraid to say the quiet parts out loud, and he will call it like it is. So today, we dive into his journey through music industry, to, through the music industry, focusing on how he balances his own artistic integrity with the commercial side of being a working composer, and we discuss his approach to merging these diverse musical styles while finding personal satisfaction in the work. So join me for a conversation on creativity, motivation, and innovation with Jameson Nathan-Jones. You know, it, it's, it's always a good thing when you stumble across a new, dare I say, content creator, even though we'll talk about how this, you know, art isn't content, um, quickly becoming one of my favorite YouTubers, speaking kind of the truth, some of, some of the hard truths we 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 might find a little uncomfortable, uh, but with a background in, in, in classical piano turned into modern synthesis, into uh, music, be creating a career as a composer, I am so happy to welcome Jameson Nathan Jones. Nathan to the podcast. Welcome so much, my friend, to the 52 Qs podcast. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Dave. Uh, it's, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here. Yeah, I saw uh, actually an interview you did with my friend John uh, Meyer. Oh yeah, um, a while back. So it's uh, John's a great guy, and yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed your, your chat with him as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I uh, had an opportunity to meet him at the Production Music Conference uh, last year, and uh, his, his like yours. You know, you not only get the bell, you get the all notifications. So you oh, just need to know well, that that one the of the highest honor, <laughs> it, right? It is the <laughs> modern YouTube high honor, right? It's the equivalent of uh, of being the first CD in the CD wallet in your uh, your visor, right? And your, then uh, YouTube might show you the video that yeah, I put. Right. I know, <laughs> chasing <laughs> maybe if chasing that like. algorithm carrot, right. man. I, I totally <laughs> boy, do I get that. But it is so good to, to be with you. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk talk with you and have you on the show is you you have a very unique perspective, right? You you didn't necessarily just come along and I want to be a film composer. I want to. It's like you you pressed really far into the classical music side of things. Mm. And so before we get started and we talk about, you know, um, your composing process and your view on 
com- the commercial applications of art. Tell us a little bit uh, about your journey and how you got to to find yourself on YouTube making videos. Well, I'm I'm still trying to figure out how that last part happened, uh, <laughs> honestly. But uh, yeah, I classically trained background. I started piano at the age of eight and uh, kind of took to it, obviously, and uh, just continued. Always wanted to be a guitarist, actually. And my mom was like, uh, music theory is best understood through the keyboard because both my parents were also musicians. And it turned out she was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a, as a percussionist and mallet player, guitar skills yeah. still baffles my mind. It's all very yeah, linear. Yeah. yeah. It's a totally different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, but it turned out, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself, but as I got into composing later on that, that it really did help me to, to be able to understand for things from a, a linear keyboard perspective. <laughs> I, I, I did really well through high school and everything. And, and then it came to the point where it's like, well, I should just major, major in this because it's what I'm best at. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I went on to get a couple of degrees in piano performance. Um, and it took me getting a master's degree in it to realize I really didn't want to be a concert pianist, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which, which is something that you should probably figure out before, you know, if you go that far. Yeah, no, I, I have, my master's is in jazz and studio drumming and yeah. I, I don't like schlepping my gear <laughs> out right. to gigs, right? That's what I should be doing, right? No, But I, I wonder, and I wonder if this was the, the case for you as well, you don't even realize the possibilities of things that are, that you can do yeah. in music. Until you get to a certain point and are exposed to those things, yeah, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think that's that's right. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of always knew I wanted to be a drummer, and so I, I had just a complete one track mind into that. Uh, so no, I I totally get that. And it wasn't until yeah you surround yourself with people who are amazing and much better at it than than you are, and they're they're doing these amazing things, and you're like, oh, hey, there's there's more than just drumming out there. Yeah, and they're doing things that like I never even considered. Uh, was a possibility, you know? Uh, It's one of those cases, I guess, where you don't really know what you want yet because you haven't been exposed to it. So you want what other people that you see around you want or want for you, you know? Um, And so that was, and I was good at it. And so it was like, well, this makes sense. You know, I'll just, you know, uh, teach and play the occasional recital, you know, um, even though I really didn't want to do those things full time. Mm -hmm. So the kind of turning point was uh, during, towards the end of my undergraduate degree, I had the opportunity to study with uh, Luigi Zaninelli, who is an incredible composition composer in his own right and composition teacher, uh, who studied with uh, Giancarlo Minotti and uh, Barber at the Curtis Institute. And so like to the, the ability to be exposed to someone from that pedigree as Myself, a kid from, I'm from Southern Mississippi, and that's where I went to school. Mm. And it just so happened that he was there as composer in residence at the mm. University of Southern Mississippi. Um, so that was a rare opportunity that that I was afforded. Um, and the fact that he was willing to take me on as a student uh, was really fortunate. And that kind of set me on the path of, okay, I think composition is what I really want to be doing. Because I always kind of had more respect for the composers than the performers, if that makes sense. Like yeah. what the composers were doing seemed like magic. Like how right. do, how is this even possible? You know, right? And, yeah. and it's like their work seems to last for centuries. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the, the players um, that that's ephemeral, mm-hmm. right? But uh, right, but yeah. the work itself is what really lasts. Exactly, exactly. So um, I was definitely intrigued by the idea of composition, and of course, I think as every young composer at some point. Uh, who was exposed to film music and game music, which I was, um, I wanted to figure out what that was all about. And like, mm. how do they, how do they do that? And what are all of these production techniques? I didn't even know what production was, you know, I was still writing with pencil and staff paper mm. um, and then just plugging it into Sibelius or whatever, you know, to be performed. Uh, it was the right. art music world, you know, Um so the idea of recorded music as its own medium was not even <laughs> really on my radar. Of course, I listened to you know rock bands, and uh, my dad was a big progressive rock fan, so he uh, and and still is, and and he loves Yes, and so I you know came up listening to all of those things, and I guess that kind of exposed me to the music technology stuff, which was new at the time, and synthesizers and all that kind of thing. Um, 
And so when I saw film composers, modern film composers and stuff, kind of marrying that world with the more traditional orchestral scoring type stuff that I was already kind of doing and more interested and familiar with, um, that seemed really intriguing um, to me. So that set me on this path of like trying to figure out how all of that works. How do you make music with a computer? Uh, what are synthesizers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are all these weird sounds that I'm hearing? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and yeah, it kind of took on its own life from there. And I discovered that I actually really like recorded music as mm. its own medium because it's so different than, than the performance side of things where you're always interpreting someone yeah. else's vision. And I was actually just talking earlier this week with, with someone, uh, he's a student actually in music college, um, kind of going through the similar thing and dealing with the elitism when when people don't fully understand <laughs> what you want to be doing because they haven't experienced it right that exists in the classical world and the world of academia and uh he was he was kind of you know saying well how do you like with a modular synth performance or something how how do you um notate that or whatever for someone else to perform and and as I thought about that, it's it's less about the performance and more it's more like a painting mm. in that case, where it's something captured in time, you know. Right. And so that capturing of that one performance, that one time, is is the art of it, rather yeah. than you know, because if you think about it, like the only way they had to preserve music <laughs> back in the time when you know, you know, Beethoven and, and all of those guys were writing was to teach it to other people to perform right. because there was no way to capture it. So right. it's a totally new world and the classical world has not really adopted or adapted um, that mindset, you know, in, in my experience. Yeah. Least, and, so. and I mean, in, in much the same way in, in the jazz, in the jazz world mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, elitism, I think, in my experience, still prevalent in in the in the the modern university you know, at least the american university so and there are pockets of universities i think that get it but as somebody coming from a uh, a media application of music you know mm -hmm. and i you know i teach at full sail which is all about you know uh preparing students for careers in the entertainment right. industry i mean just unapologetically so mm -hmm. whereas you know you take uh some of our local colleges here in town, or you know, back in North Carolina, where I where I went to school in Memphis, the actual like, how are students going to make money? How are they going to have careers in this? Was almost an afterthought. And so I, I remember in my undergrad at Appalachian State. This may this may not be how it is, but how it was was like the film composers was almost seemed seemed like a you're selling out you know, and it's like, ugh. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to be an electronic musician, it wasn't, you know, like, um, <laughs> it wasn't EDM, you know, right. or, or anything like that. It wasn't like trip hop and lo-fi. It was like Edgar Varese and Bleep Blorp experimental kind of stuff. It yeah. was- Avant-garde, yeah. Yes, firmly, you know, art with a capital A. <laughs> um, was, was that was that your experience as well? And and do you, do you think that, universities kind of see the writing on the wall as far as, hey, students need to be able to make a living to pay their student loans and all of that. Do you see that changing? Um, well, to answer the second part, I personally don't see it changing um, because the people who are teaching are so kind of old school, mm -hmm. at least. And that's just, you know, I'm just kind of sharing the experience of the people that I know that are doing yeah. it and in you know, and, and especially you have to consider where I am, uh, <laughs> you know, in South Mississippi, it's, I think we're always at least 50 years behind technologically and, you know, every way. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, um, you know, they're just starting to come around to recorded music as a medium at all. You know, it's like, <laughs> we have an ADAC um, player in our electronic I know, music lab, right. guys. Like, have you heard of this four track uh, <laughs> tape machine? It's really wild. We just got digital performer. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I haven't personally seen it changing, but I also, the old guard is still there yeah. enough that has that mentality of that it's all 
got to be the way that it always has been, you know. And what was the first part of your question? I've already forgotten. Well, j- just <laughs> as far as like, uh, well, uh, what what would it take to change that? Is it just so yeah. like ingrained and myopic that it's just like kind of the blind leading the blind and they're just going to keep on going? Well, I think it's great that there are schools like you mentioned uh, with Full Sail that are, you know, leaning into the, the fact that, hey, it would probably be good if people could actually make a career and make a living out of this. And what are the realistic avenues through which to do that? All of my education, like I said, was classical. You know, it was classically focused. And that's that was never, as a performance major in the classical world, that was never even mentioned or thought about. Like, how am I going to make money with this? The only options really presented to me were what I saw everyone else doing, which was you graduate, as a pianist, you accompany for all the string players or whatever, right. which is, by the way, an incredible amount of work for almost no pay. Um, <laughs> and zero glory. <laughs> oh, none. You're just none. a piano monkey in the back. <laughs> yeah, you're just the guy who has to sight read the orchestral reduction for their concerto, which is really like, um, you know, you're basically reading, you know, five or six parts while, you know, the flautist has their one line that they play. And it sounds super <laughs> impressive because they play it really fast, but it's right. like, we're we're sweating, you know? Right, yeah. Um, so yeah, I lived that life all through my graduate degree. I, that's what my graduate assistantship was in. Hmm. So I, I knew I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. And, uh, you know, the only other option was to teach and yeah. to teach people to do the exact, to follow the exact same path that I was on that I didn't really want to be on. So obviously that didn't seem like a thing that I wanted to continue to pursue. So yeah, it was never, and and the people who were learning those things were in the music industry program, uh, yep. which is probably more more akin to what you're you're doing and teaching. Um, and and the funny thing is, those people were just ultimately looked down upon by yeah, the classical it, it, world, let's, like let's, as let's, lesser than you know. Let's let's say that out loud, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, like I am ashamed of 1992, Dave. You know, mm-hmm. who, who, you had the guitar players and the drum set player, not jet, like the rock guys come in and, yeah. and there was no place for them. If it wasn't classical, if it wasn't marching band, maybe jazz band, but like somebody that came in and wanted, you know, they could, they could play every rush lick, you know, mm-hmm. on guitar, there was no place for them. So they just went into the industries. Meanwhile, the, <laughs> the program's just churning out performance majors and band directors. And we're all either like not getting jobs or whatever. Meanwhile, the industry guys are going getting jobs at music stores. They're running record labels, right? They're they're signing. And uh, you're right. If, if we're being honest, and this is what I really really appreciate you, man, appreciate about you, is uh, it was look they were looked down upon. Yeah. So I just want to uh, apologize. Yeah. I'm just gonna. I'm, they don't listen to this podcast. I'm just putting it out into the universe. I apologize for being a schmuck about that. Yeah. And I was the same, you know, I, I kind of adopted that same, well, they must not be real musicians or whatever. They must not know, be because, that good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was, it's a weird thing. But then also, you know, it's sort of the self-fulfilling prophecy that I think a lot of artists have um, in the classical world in particular, where it's like, oh, well, not as many people can or want to do this, so it must make what I'm doing superior mm. to, you know. Yep. And it 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 is hard, and that that's another thing to give, to give the classical world and the jazz world some credit and some understanding of why they develop that mentality. It is incredibly difficult. It is. It's like I've I've likened it uh, before to being a professional athlete level of discipline that you have to have to perform at that level, um, without the pay that comes right. along with being a professional athlete, obviously. That's right. Um, so I think when you're that, when you have to be that hyper focused at something, it's very easy to get tunnel vision and just be like, well, everybody else is just not worth my time. That's right. You know, um, so, but it's just, it's just a totally different, different world. Yeah, I had a, it's not a world I wanted to, to live in forever. <laughs> yeah. I had a, percu- I, I knew I wasn't cut out to be a performance major <laughs> when I saw a percussionist friend of mine spend four hours working on tambourine thumb roll technique, like in a practice mm-hmm. room for four mm-hmm. hours, just mm-hmm. for four straight hours so that he could play this one part in an orchestra. And ultimately, I think his goal was to go get gigs at orchestra in yep. orchestras, highly competitive. You mentioned professional oh. athletes. 
the, the, it's as competitive, yes. uh, and you have as much of a chance getting a, a mm-hmm. being the principal tempest for you know the New York Phil, or even you know the Greensboro Phil, Greensboro, yeah. North Carolina, you know as an athlete does of being a professional athlete, which boggled my mind, which is why I wanted to be a film composer, even yeah. though it was kind of like downplayed. It was seen as kind of less than, let alone like game music. Oh, you want to make music for video games? <laughs> How dare you? Video games are for children. Right. I mean, fast forward 30 years. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, those are that, that's how you're able to make a living. So I, I like I said, I really appreciate how you just you, you speak truth to that. And 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 like in, in your video about music degrees being a waste of time, I love the fact that you said that going to school isn't necessarily a waste of time. You there are advantages, but mm-hmm. music degrees aren't required. Is is, is yeah? The did piece I get of paper. That right? The piece of paper is worthless. Right. The piece, no one cares about the piece of paper. Yep. I gained experience through that that I now view as like my superpowers. If, mm. you know, that's a very conceited way to put it. I don't literally think I have superpowers, <laughs> but, um, but I, I view that as things that set me apart from everybody else who's doing similar things. Yeah. It's like, well, I've, I, you know, say what you want. <laughs> A lot of the music uh, in the classical world has lasted a long time, and there's a reason for it. It's because it's really well crafted yeah. uh, most of the time. And so, getting exposed to all that and getting to know all of that music really intimately, it can't do anything but help, right? Mm. Um, and then go on to influence my own style um, in some way, even if it's subconsciously. Uh, so, I've I've come to. Like if you had asked me right out of school, I was so burned out, I would have been like, yeah, I wish I'd never done that and just had started learning a DAW sooner and like <laughs> doing my own thing. Um, but now with a little more age and maturity and more gray hairs, um, <laughs> it, it's it's start, starting to become, <clears throat> excuse me, clear to me that uh, it was kind of a necessary thing to get me where I am uh, today. But, but when people ask me for advice, I, I get nervous about giving advice in any way <laughs> because I, I don't live their life experience. But yeah, um, it, it's it's how expensive it is is what makes yeah. me really question like should like this uh, this is not for everybody. Yeah, as somebody know? with you know <laughs> crippling student debt myself, both my wife and I, mm. I totally understand that. Would I trade it? I, I don't think so. I mean, there I have not Same. just lifelong friendships, but. Um, the skills that I learned along mm-hmm. the way, you can learn them, you know, through YouTube videos, you can learn some of those skills, like with a private teacher, but that experience was, you know, like in the movie, uh, Inside Out, right? There, there are some core memories. There are some mm-hmm. core personality, professionalism, some core beliefs that were uh, really etched, etched into the Mount Rushmore of, of my id that occurred during my time in school, that I'm not sure I would be quite the same. Uh, I wouldn't be the same shape if, yeah. I, if, I, if I didn't go have that experience. No doubt. Yeah, it, it will change you in some way, um, no doubt. And that, that applies to, to every experience that we have, kind of culminates uh, into what we end up eventually becoming so yeah and, and i yeah. think as, as long as you don't if as long as you're not going to school to get the paper i think that's yeah. if you're going to school yeah. to absorb as much as you can in a super constant like super concentrated mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about like you know those little vitamin c tablets you can take to fight off a cold that's it's what it yeah. is super concentrated environment you set aside you know three to four years of your life to pour because what i what i realize is you know in the moment, you don't realize how kind of special this time is and how free you are from like mortgages and family and everything. It yeah. really is a very, very uh, fertile time to pour into bettering yourself and your craft. That's really hard to come by. I know I, I washed out of school the first time, you know, eight years later, went back to school and had a completely different appreciation mm. for, for the uh, college experience. And I'm looking at folks like not paying attention or sleeping in class, you know, wondering why the tests are so hard. And I'm like, 
the professor is literally telling you the answers. All you have to right, do yeah. is just be awake and, and you can you can get it. But but yeah. anyway. <laughs> I want to I want to change gears a little bit. Um, because I could talk about like elitism and all that stuff all day. Mm. But um, I want to talk about another one of your videos, the uh how content kills creativity. Because you know, 52 Qs, we focus um, like laser focused on production and library music. And I know you have mm -hmm. some experience in that, mm -hmm. but library music more so than like film music and game music sits so squarely at the intersection of commerce and art. The music we're playing is in yep. the background. You know, it's for lack of a better term, if we're just keeping it 100 here, it's pretty disposable. It has to sound great. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be necessarily art with it with a capital A. And and I wanted to get your take on that and how, you know, I call it the artisan mentality, right? I don't consider myself exactly. an artist. I'm an yep. artisan. Um, yep. But I wanted to get your take um, because you have a, a really, really good perspective on that, knowing that you've done some library and production music. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um you know, as I started getting into it more and got better at production and everything, I was like, well, this makes sense for me to do this. And of course, my first thought was, well, I'll just make whatever I want and then people will take it and use it how I feel TV, like right. it should be used, right? Not really the way it works, turns out. Um, yeah, you're a, you actually took exactly what I was going to say. It's a, you're, you're an artisan mm -hmm. in that case. So like, let's say you're a carpenter and somebody is like, well, I need you to make me a chair and it needs to serve this purpose, right? And I need to be able to sit in it for long periods and it be comfortable and me not really notice the chair. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you're like, I got it. I know exactly what you need. And you go and you make the most ornate chair that has like uh, rhinestones on the bottom <laughs> because you feel like that's what you need to do. And that's like where the person is supposed to sit, but you don't think about them actually having to sit in the chair. Right. That's the only way you can express yourself. Is yeah. That like, I just felt like yep. for me, those rhinestones in the seat of the chair was my artistic voice coming through. Right. right. So if I needed you're not to, comfortable, to include then that. that. Then that's on you really. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't you want to sit on rhinestones? Um, <laughs> And then the person gets the chair and they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> this is not even remotely what I asked for. It's not going to serve the purpose that I wanted it to serve. I can't use this chair. I'm sorry. And that was kind of my realization um, because I do, I do strongly, and this is one reason I've kind of gone the direction with my career that I have, and I don't do a lot of production music anymore because it just wasn't for me really. Mm. Um, and that's an okay thing to say. Yeah. Um, if it's not for you, you shouldn't do it because that's exactly what you'll be asked to do is make music that serves a specific purpose uh, that's laser focused on what uh, the brief requires, right? Yeah. And a lot of times it's not exactly what you want to be doing. So I, I went a different direction um, where it's like, well, I started to have a little bit of success um, with my own music. Uh, well, backing up a little further, when I wanted to get into film scoring, this does relate, I promise. Sure. <laughs> when I wanted to get into film scoring, we'll see if I actually tie it back. Uh, when I wanted to get into film scoring early on, I was like, well, it seems to me there are two ways to do it. I can move to LA, which I was about to do, and I don't know anybody out there. I'm just going to start trying to write like Hans Zimmer and hope that somebody hires me. That's right. Yeah, if I build and it, I think it will that's, come. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the approach that a lot of people take. It didn't take me long to realize that everybody else is doing that. <laughs> so I probably won't have a great deal of success being Hans Zimmer better than Hans Zimmer. Um, so then I said, I started to notice composers like, uh, or artists like um, Oliver Arnolds, mm. who is kind of in the same kind of similar genre that I tend to make music in as well now. Um, and what I noticed was he was getting film scoring work, but they didn't come to Oliver Arnold's and ask him to make a Hans Zimmer cue. They came to him because he sounded like him. Right. And that was interesting. And then, uh, you know, Trent Reznor also seemed to be doing something kind of similar and having a reasonable amount of success. But nobody goes to Trent Reznor and is like, hey, can you write this big epic hybrid orchestral cue for right. me? They want Trent Reznor to sound like Trent Reznor. So I was like, maybe that's 
my way in, is to figure out what unique things I have to say, get as good as I can at making music in my own unique voice using all of that background that I had to, to kind of differentiate myself maybe from some other people and just go all in on that and just focus on being a recording artist. And then kind of like you said, if I build it, they will come. Mm. And that kind of worked. Uh, I was able to get some film scoring work and stuff like that. I'm not saying I've done anything that anyone would ever have heard of, but I've <laughs> done some indie, some indie sure. films and things like that. Knowing no one, having no connections, I still live in Mississippi. There is no film music world here. There's not much of anything here. Football, there are, cow, there are a lot of cows, a lot of cows, <laughs> yeah. football on the weekends. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, I think there are those kind of two ways to go about it. But if you're going to go, and so that's why when I got into the production music world, see, I'm tying it back in. <laughs> well done. Um, I, I kind of, I realized that that was very similar to just trying to get a job as a film composer when you've done nothing to that point hmm. and having to then conform to whatever the director wants you to do, right? right? And while I do think it's important to have a wide skill set, I just wasn't super interested in writing every kind of genre. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the kind of thing you, to really be good at production music, you have to be um, pretty skilled at writing a wide range of things, uh, at least in my experience. Right. Uh, and even even the production music that I have done, I did after I was a little bit established as an artist. So they usually weren't coming to me with like the Hans Zimmer stuff, but they would come to me because they knew I like synthesizers with like, can you write the synth pop thing or whatever? And I was like, well, right. I don't really do that, but I could try it. And then I kind of had to learn how to write in that way, which was good, um, even though it wasn't what I ultimately wanted to do forever, you know, so um there's there's tremendous value even if you don't ultimately want to do that and at least trying it for a while i think um well but yeah it, you're it, totally you're totally right it's not the same as just like imposing your vision on whatever project yeah it and, is, and it's right? it's a it's a relatively low risk uh, mm -hmm. environment to get better like let's say like yeah. you know what i kind of like writing hip hop beats but I, you know, I don't want to necessarily write like commercially released hip hop or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to do a Ludwig Göransson kind of like mashup kind of thing, right? Yep. Um, it's 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 relatively low risk, you know, because That's true. it's not you as an artist putting your stuff out there, mm -hmm. and then you know, I hope I, I hope somebody validates me. It's nothing. It's nothing like that. And um, you you're, you speak a lot to kind of uh, or, or kind of what you're getting at is is uh, like the burnout, the creative, the creative uh, mm. emptiness, you know, where you're not feeling fulfilled. And I have found success in finding the thing that you really like doing, that kind of just flows out of your your muse or whatever, and then looking at the segment of the production music industry that most closely aligns, right? It's mm -hmm. not going to, it's not going to be a, a, a 100% fit, just like, you know, that your, your presidential candidate of choice isn't going to be 100% yeah. your, like, straight down your values. Mm -hmm. You find the one that, that matches the most and you vote for them, um, in theory. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but for production music, I have found you know, that, uh, like my, my spirit animals are like Thomas Newman, right. Love mm. me some Bear McCreary. Right. I love, oh, me yeah. I love some Bear. Danny Elfman, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, with a little hint of like Bob Ross. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, if I can find production music that fills that and then start pitching it, getting some placements, getting into some libraries till eventually, hopefully if this all works well, then the library will start taking your work as you because yeah. you've it's like you know if you're a sushi chef here comes yet another analogy you know you're gonna learn to make california rolls over and over and over but eventually mm -hmm. people will come to your restaurant because they want the sushi that you make i don't know or maybe i just need lunch <laughs> maybe i'm just hungry <laughs> it is about that time i guess yeah but yeah. I, I think no, that's right yeah it's, it's 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 a real challenge and um 
and keeping in the artisan mentality and struggling with being fulfilled. And do you think that's what it was that kind of just drew you away from it? Like fundamentally, it just wasn't rewarding enough? Or you just yeah, didn't want to be I bossed think, around creatively? I think it was the volume of it. Um, and the fact that I didn't feel like uh, I had enough time to do my own thing, which I still very much wanted to remain my focus, mm. you know, uh, because I was already, you know, uh, somewhat established as as a recording artist uh, at that point. Um, so yeah, it was taking a little bit too much of my time, I guess, yeah. to, to the amount of time that you would really need to devote to it, which is another thing maybe people don't consider, is like, you know, it, when they call or, or send you an email, you know, at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, there goes your weekend sometimes. Right. <laughs> you know, if like, if 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 the client needs the brief, in 24 or 48 hours, you got to get it there, you That's know? Right. And that, that was not really what I wanted to be taking up yeah. so much of my time. You know? And, you um, know, in, in your uh, art isn't content a video, you know, you talk about giving yourself time for experimentation, you know, for play yeah, and the, yeah. and just the sheer volume of cues you need to produce. That's not really possible. Is it? That's kind of what I felt like I was missing. And, and I'm a big proponent of like making your own sounds and stuff. And a lot of the comments that I get on those, cause I love synthesis, right. Mm -hmm. And sound design at this point, now that I figured out what those, that those things exist. Right. <laughs> um, uh, and I get a lot of the pushback that I get on those kinds of videos is like, well, I don't have time to use anything but presets. And I'm like, I get it, <laughs> you know, and I'm kind of, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. Right. Um, I, even though I do think you benefit if you do set aside some time from experimentation and then you have tools you can draw on in making your own sounds and you can get there faster, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it was, it was really a time issue and the fact that it was taking up parts of my schedule that I wasn't comfortable with in relation to the rewards which is it's oftentimes, at least with some of the companies that I've worked with, kind of a zero sum possibility of like, you you know, some of them do pay, you know, if you write a queue, um, but a lot of them only pay if it's the one that's chosen, which means right. that they've sent it to 10 composers. So you got a one in 10 chance of being paid right. and you've just worked all weekend on it. And, 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 and if you make air, and then it might be nine to twelve months later before you see royalties, and exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. I, I, so yeah. that those are all the things that I didn't know going in, and kind mm -hmm. of took me by surprise, I guess. Yeah. And at the same time, I was also thinking I should start, you know, developing something that is mine mm -hmm. that I have ownership over. And that was about the time I was getting started with the YouTube channel, yeah, uh, as well. And and then I realized how much time that was going to take, and I had to choose one or the other. You yeah, know, and, and, that kind of thing. and I think it's fantastic that you recognize that, you know what, this, is, this isn't for me. You know, I've talked on this channel, production music isn't for everybody, just mm -hmm. like, you know, painting houses isn't for everybody, right. or, or being a world-class guitarist, you know, isn't for everybody. And that's completely okay. I also, yeah, it doesn't mean it's bad, and it doesn't mean that it's not yep. a necessity. Like, it needs... That music needs to exist. It serves That's a purpose. Right. Yep. So, some, yeah. some, somebody's going to make air on Temptation Island, right? Somebody's going to mm -hmm. get, get that placement. Mm -hmm. Why not you if you have that desire? Yeah. What I have found has helped is making sure that I have some, uh, some other creative outlets, whether it's teaching, whether it's creating YouTube videos, whether it's mm -hmm. just, you know learning to to write novels, you know, right? Or riding yeah. motorcycles or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Having some other outlet so that all of your eggs isn't in this basket. Because if mm -hmm. all you do is wake up and then just make waffles all day, you're going to get so sick of making waffles. It's like, man, if I just need to make an omelet, but you know, nope, they keep, keep ordering waffles. So that can be, that can yeah. be a real challenge. <laughs> you're making me really hungry, by the way. Yeah. yeah. It, it's about lunchtime here. <laughs> Uh, but only food analogies from here on out. Only right? food analogies. <laughs> so don't put all of your eggs in one basket. And, and omelets. That's and, all I got. Omelets and uh, with bacon, bacon, <laughs> artisan bacon from, from people who really want to make bacon. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, let's change gears just a little bit here because you, you touched on the things that really 
that really come out of you, and that is synthesis and sound design. I'd love to hear about your composing process, uh, y- your video on how like Mario taught me to finish music. That's really, re- I did a, a, an episode about everything I learned uh, from gaming, you know, and how it applies to yeah. being a production music composer. Talk a little bit about your process and, and how your classical training, your theory brain, your, your piano chops, how, how does that all kind of dovetail together? Well, it's something that's kind of ever evolving, I think. And it's been, I hate to use the word a struggle, because it's a struggle I really enjoyed trying to figure out how to like blend those two worlds together. Um, because when I started getting involved, I really I found that I really loved the textures and the sounds that I heard in ambient music, mm-hmm. but I didn't always necessarily love the fact that harmonically and melodically there wasn't a lot going on. And, I, and that's not a judgment on that style of music. Uh, it's still very beautiful, even if you just have a, a drone that continues for you know 10 minutes or whatever uh, and the interesting thing was the texture variation to me but it's like hmm how can i combine kind of that world with the more linear i guess more traditional style that i used to write in and still like to write in like for solo piano which i still do a lot of writing for kind of makes sense right <laughs> um so now I- i'm still like even if it's it's all synthesizers. I still like to incorporate some sort of some sort of through line or some sort of linear writing uh, that's really well thought out, so that I'm thinking in terms like, for instance, a chord progression to me is not necessarily just a like a chord progression as we would think of it in a pop song. It's more like a a chance to do part writing, mm-hmm. you know, but with synthesizers. <laughs> Uh, so I'm doing like, I'm an organist as well. Uh, that's actually my full-time gig is I'm a church organist. And uh, so I've, I've got a lot of experience playing chorales, you yeah. know, and with this kind of understanding, like, okay, moving in contrary motion, and each voice is really its own melody, right? Uh, and that kind of thing isn't really considered a lot in synthesizer music uh, that I hear uh, anyway. I'm sure it exists out there. Um so kind of combining those elements with the the interesting sound design, which I also can get lost just making patches mm. for hours. And it's just like, where did the time go, you know? Um, so I love trying to combine those worlds with varying degrees of success. Sometimes it doesn't work out, I, I think. Uh, and sometimes uh, sometimes it does. And, and I just love the experiment of trying to bring those two worlds kind of together. You know, and it's an ongoing experiment for me. Do Do you find that the hardware manipulation? Because I know you've talked about going dollless and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, is that uh, like a necessity, or is that just something that just kind of unlocks a, another level? It's not a necessity, and at all. Uh, in fact, I'm I've gotten more careful lately to to be sure that I try to convey that you don't have to have all the gear. Mm. Uh, especially these days, right? You can do it all in the box if you want. Um, but for me, I think also as a performer uh, and growing up as a performer, having the hands-on ability to change things, to just reach out and grab a knob. Uh, well, I have a synth right in front of me here. That's mm. why I keep looking at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just realized you couldn't see that. <laughs> um, the tactile interaction with something is something that I connect with very much mm. uh, from a performance background. And also the the fact that it makes me do different things. Like I've discovered that I'll turn a knob, like on a on a synth with an analog mixer, I'll turn that knob past where it distorts. Whereas if I'm clicking with a mouse for some reason, I never go to extremes. Mm. And so then I never quite kind of find the, all the sweet spots uh, I've right. discovered for myself. So um, I think you just interact with it in a different way and it, it definitely changes the way you work, but it is also true that the the end listener doesn't care, right? Like they don't care what you made it on. If it moves them emotionally, that's all they care about. But I do think it affects the way that you create. Um, and, and also with hardware, you're kind of forced to commit to things mm-hmm. in a way that you're not necessarily, if you're just 
have everything in MIDI all the time, and the DAW yeah, can change. Like the choices matter, right? Yeah, because yeah. It, it's about it's about to be locked in, and it, it exactly. is you know yeah. it is a uh, it's a heavy lift to try to get back to where you were, either mentally or even phys- physically. If you got knobs and everything, you know, I've been mm-hmm. learning guitar lately, so I've got my little dinky four pedal pedal board uh, because there is something you know, about having a guitar pedal and and tweaking a knob and that yep. instant reaction. And there, there's something to the, the tangibility that I think un- unlocks a creative connection, a, a neural pathway that it's not that it doesn't exist in in the digital space. I just think it's tougher to, to it happen. Is. It's not, it's not as natural. Yeah. There are, there are limitations that you're forced into that kind of channel your creativity with hardware mm-hmm. i've yep. found whereas you can implement those limitations in the daw if you even know what they are and to me that took having experience with the hardware to realize what the limitations were and now i can use the daw in a different way does that yeah. does that make sense oh yeah totally so it's it's not just like when i first opened a daw you know, I was right out of a master's degree in piano, had no idea what I was doing. It's like, what is a limiter? What's a compressor? I don't know. Um, it was way overwhelming. And mm. and everything just kind of sounded bland. And, and the DAW is so clean. Everything kind of sounded, I, I think I've called it hospital-esque. Yeah, anti- antiseptic, like, right? Yeah, exactly. Like two... To, and I don't mean clean in terms of a good mix because the mixes were terrible, <laughs> but I mean clean in terms of there was no character to anything. Right. It was clinical you know, it was precision. Just, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, it, it was a process to, because I didn't, the only teaching I had in that was watching YouTube videos and figuring yeah. it out. So, uh, getting hardware, even just a few pieces of hardware, helped me kind of understand oh, okay. Well, a filter does this, and I can limit the frequency range of something, and then things fit together when I'm stacking and layering. Well, I could just do that with an EQ in the DAW. Yeah. But now I realize how <laughs> how drastic some of those EQ changes for sound design need to be. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Because when uh, you when you see it on a knob, it might just be a you know a thirty percent knob tweak. But what you're mm-hmm. really doing is like a fifteen decibel uh, sweep or filter that looks like bonkers to actually do it. Yeah, like I would have never done that. Like I kept hearing everybody, you know, in their mixing videos talk about, well, it's all the subtle changes. So I never did anything that made a difference, really. Right. <laughs> and then you felt like gaslighted because you didn't hear it. I, I exactly. Think I, hear it. Like, I don't hear it. I'm terrible. It's like, man, uh, how did I get through music school with ears this bad? You know? <laughs> well, I mean, going back to our first, you know, topic that it's not really taught. I mean, we had no. one electronic music class, you know, and it was basically how to run digital performer. And this mm. is MIDI. And yeah, the schools don't really prepare you for for any any of that. Again, all those industries cat, all those industry cats, they got all of that business, but uh, but the ed majors, no, we didn't see yeah. that. But no, I think um, the 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 other thing is when you get a piece of hardware, I think you really commit to it. Like I have yeah. spent more time, like working with my little pedal board here, mm-hmm. and like okay, this is a compressor, and it only has three knobs, but how how do I really get sound? Whereas if I have a plug-in, I'm just like, okay, preset, preset. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, here's I have literally five or six other compressors I can choose from. Mm-hmm. You know, I in Logic, I have like seven compressors in one plug-in. And it's it's easy to get super overwhelmed. It's easy to get lost. And it's easy to just keep keep scrolling. But if you have a piece of yeah. hardware, I think you're gonna commit to learning it a little bit better. Totally. That is a hundred percent true. Yeah. And it's one of the beauties of modular as well, modular synths and like the Matriarch, uh, which is a semi-modular synth and has no presets at all. Mm. That's the one that I keep looking at. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a matter of exploring it because you have a, a limited number of resources and also you spent more money on it. So right. you tend to put in a little more time um, to really learn the thing. And, and I've actually stopped buying synthesizers at this point because I found... Um, that I was kind of just skating across the surface. I almost, I was almost becoming a collector. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like, I don't want to do that. I want to use all of them for what they're good at doing. And I can't go deep enough into any one of them to really discover that if I keep buying them. So I'm on a, I'm on a buying pause 
At yeah, least, I hear you. at yeah. least for the next half hour, you know. At no least until the Black Friday sales come in. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of that way as well. Like I am on a uh, like an orchestral plug-in pause. Mm. Like, don't come at me, Spitfire. Don't 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 come at me, 8DO. I just I'm not going to do it. Yeah, it's but, overwhelming. But yeah, but the but the mixing plugins and the presets, like your video, I felt. I felt totally uh, called out on your quit buying presets video oh. <laughs> Be- because my, my path to learning Omnisphere, for example, mm-hmm. because you open it up and you're like, hey, wow, close, because it's so overwhelming. But getting uh, presets specifically um, from Matt Bowdler of, of The Unfinished, mm-hmm. he makes these amazing presets. And because it's Omnisphere, I could look and, and, and look at all of his programming Yep. And so yep. it was through seeing his programming that I that I really started to understand. Now, his next preset patch, I'm going to buy it on day one, but I do f- feel a little released from that kind of box. If it's not in the preset, I can't, I just kind of keep scrolling presets because that is, mm-hmm. that is creative molasses, right? That is, that is sandpaper in the gears of your creative, uh, or, uh, yeah, in, of your creative engine. And it just stops mm-hmm. the whole process. Just no, no patch after patch after patch. Yeah, for sure. And I think I even mentioned in that video, like it's not really anti-preset. It's just yeah. like, don't only use presets all, all the time, yeah. you know? Um, because I saw that, I say that as someone who has sold synth presets. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> like I'm, I, you know, going to be like, hey, don't buy any presets. Um, Except for mine. <laughs> exactly. Why Why you should only buy my presets. Right, exactly. That's my next YouTube video, right. actually. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I pointed out in that video that like you can reverse engineer patches. It's a great way to learn. Yep. A great way to learn synthesis or, you know, sound design or anything else. Um, totally valid. Yeah. Well, well, Nathan, again, thank you so much for joining. If, if folks want to uh, hear from you, um, where, where can they find you? Uh, it's Jameson Nathan Jones, pretty much everywhere. Uh, Instagram, YouTube is probably where I'm most active these days. Been really uh, focused on the YouTube channel in the last couple years coming up on now. Mm. Um, just starting to get into to offering some some coaching and courses and that kind of thing on composition since I kind of come from a unique background yeah. uh, with all of that. So yeah, I, trying I think, to get all that stuff rolling. Yeah. I think you occupy rarefied air, like church organist who is also into modular synth synthesis. That's going to be a really small Facebook group, I, mean, it's, I imagine. It's a, it's a story as old as time itself, right? <laughs> the, the guy learns the church organ, the pipe organ, and then gets into modular synths. It's just, yep. you know, very, yeah. very standard stuff. <laughs> yeah, where's the where's the Disney musical on that story? I want to know exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and speaking of composition, you also have an ebook that folks can uh, can do. Uh, get. That is at bit.ly slash free composition guide. We're gonna have the link to that in our yeah. show notes for yeah, sure. Yeah, that that is absolutely free. Um, yeah, it's kind of just some techniques that have helped me that kind of come from my classical background and studying with Mr. Zaninelli that I've applied kind of to the stuff that I make now um, and, and it's really kind of helped focus my creativity in, in a world where I was way overwhelmed with all of the options, <laughs> you know, in yeah. sound design and everything that I was presented with. It was great writing that because, and making videos about that those topics because it kind of reminds me as well of like, oh yeah, I need to get back to this myself, yeah, you know? It's, it's so. fantastic. Your perspective is so valuable and and your unique perspective. I mean, there are many of us, you know, music school refugees who are trying to like carve out a living in, uh, in, uh, in music for media or as artists, and much of which weren't necessarily, uh, we weren't prepared through music school itself. So I think you have... Yeah a hugely valuable perspective. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining Oh, Thank you, today. Dave. Uh, it was a pleasure to be on. Really enjoyed it. Once again, a huge word of thanks to Nathan for joining me on the podcast today. And as always, we'll have his links in the description below. So please be sure to check those out. And also a huge word of thanks to the member subscribers of 52Qs who pay their actual real life money to keep all of this going. We are 100% community supported. So if you like what I do here, don't thank me thank them. But if you want to learn more about how you can support 52Qs and also get all of those subscriber perks, then head over to 52Qs.com and join us. Remember, it's free to join, 
and memberships start at just four bucks a month. Uh, you definitely want to tune in next week where I am going to be asking what happens after the library wants your cue. From, from timelines to expectations to etiquette to deliverables, what are the chain of events that get kicked off when the library says yes? So you definitely want to tune in and why don't you uh, smash that subscribe uh, so that you never miss an episode. But that's going to do it for me this week. I hope you've had a fantastic week so far and I know that the rest of your week is going to be amazing. And how do I know that friends? Because I trust and believe that the universe has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2023 at 18 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Qs.com.